All right, I guess it's recording now. All right, so welcome to the Comic Rundown brought to you by Comic Den 316. I'm your host, Ace Knuckles, and I have our special guest, David Fleming. How are you, David? Great. How are you doing? Uh, it feels a little weird introducing you and asking you how you are when we've been sitting here talking for about 45 minutes, but whatever, this is a podcast, so they didn't know before I said it. Tell that why you've not been talking for that long. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Seems like a lot longer. Uh, so it took us a little while to get this set up, but... You know, I would ask you how does it feel to be a guest in the Comic Den, but we are in a uh, business center in a hotel. So is this the best podcast you've ever done so far? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Way better than my den at home. Yeah? Uh, what do you have as a den at home? Like, where do you, where do you hide out? Uh, basement. Basement? I got, I got banished to the basement from having after the first kid. Okay. Did you, I mean, is it decorated or oh, just No. It's like, it's like, not, it's, well, it's got a carpet. Okay. But it's like just, it's not stapled or anything. It's just okay. laying down. Yeah, like a dungeon. Oh, it's a straight up that's dungeon. What, that's what I call mine. It's the, I mean, it's the comic den, but I can't call it the comic dungeon or nobody's going <laughs> to that. Puts off that real serial rapist vibe. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen pictures, but we have a split level. So our first basement, I have all my pictures and frames and stuff like that. Up. And then we can go down further into the basement, and that's where it's just unfinished, painted concrete floors, cinder blocks. Uh, that's where I take all my pictures. That's where I have all my setup. So um, I like it. I like the aesthetic to it. It's real raw and kind of nasty. Yeah, that's, but, that's where I'm at with it, yeah. too. All right, so uh, Fleming, tell us who you are and why we should care. Feel free <laughs> to plug anything that you have at this point. Too. That's perfect. Uh, so, yeah, like you said, uh, my name is David Fleming. Uh, full-time, I am a drawing and painting high school teacher, part-time, I'm an illustrator, and who I am. Yeah, uh, so since Fleming has a super loud voice, we're maxing out the uh, speakers. Um, so go ahead, tell us who you are and why we should care. All right, so why I have a super loud voice is because full-time, I am a high school drawing and painting teacher. Part-time, uh, I'm an illustrator and comic creator. I've been doing that part for about three years now, but maybe a little bit more. And uh, I love comics, always have loved comics. I've always loved storytelling. That's why I continue to do my art and to do my comic side of my art. Uh, you should care because I'm the super bomb daddy dog. And uh, yeah, I, don't know. I love comics and I, have, I got a good voice. So let's just do this thing. Yeah, so uh, rumor has it that you are the Mumford and Sons of uh, comic books and comic book art. Uh, that comes straight from Chris Rao. I was going to say, that sounds like a Rao thing to say. Yeah, yeah, he said, you are hipster to the max, and you try to act like you're above the cutting edge. You you like things before they're cool. Oh, yeah, like I, I like the miners before they're underground kind of thing. Yeah, we, uh, we were talking, and I said that you had really gotten me into some of these smaller print uh, comics, and I said that I don't think anything's quite small print enough for you unless it's written on a napkin and stapled together in some bar. Actually, I'm probably super into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I was right. All right, so for those of you that are new here, let me explain what Comic Rundown's all about. First, I find someone who pities me enough to talk to me. Then I choose a comic I feel fits their personality. Uh, today, I've got you reading um, Southern Bastards, and that's what we're gonna discuss. Uh, I felt it kind of met your qualifications of a smaller print. Also, it's from a KC native, Jason Aaron. Uh, so I see his stuff all the time at Comic-Con, and all I ever have for him to sign is, you know, Thor. So I figured I'd give some of his other stuff. All right, please remember, people, I am not an expert, nor am I a comic historian. I'm just a dude with a dude talking about a thing I read once. So in the comments, don't destroy me whenever we get something wrong or you think I done something that's worth being beaten. All right, so let's talk about your art before we get into this. All right, uh, what's your origin story when it comes to comics and your art? Awesome. All right, origin story. Uh, super mega nerd dad who used to always take us to those like, uh, you know, like the game stores where you play like the tabletop, like Warhammer kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I remember like when we were kids, we always ended up at that kind of place or like a used bookstore and he'd be finding some like old sci-fi novel to read and we would just find the corner. There'd always be like these funny like corners where there's like a beanbag chair and like comics and it was like uh -huh. obviously like the dump your, your kids here so you can go around the video store kind of place. <laughs> yeah. So I remember like uh, reading lots of old comics because it was like, even, I was reading co old comics even for the time I was reading comics because I'd okay. be picking up like 
runs of like uh, Green Lantern and like original Guardians of the Galaxy, um, stuff like that. That was like the Marvel that came out more like 70s, 80s and not like the actual 90s when I was reading stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, eventually, I remember that it was like, we read it so much that my dad was like, you want to go to comic shops and buy actual comics? And yeah. so that was like young, young me reading tons of comics, got older, dropped it completely, was like, knew I loved that kind of stuff, but you know, didn't really know what to do with it. Right. Uh, I remember in high school, I like started doing art classes again, and that's when I was like, why, wait, wait, hold on, why do I like art? Oh yeah, that's right, because comics are like <laughs> the bomb diggity. Like, so I, that was when I like picked stuff back up, was like probably like college, I like started subscribing to like new comics and stuff again, yeah. and was like, oh yeah, that's right, this is like what I love to draw, because for a while I was just, like I did art in college to have to be an right. art teacher, and I drew still lights and all the boring stuff that gets really stuffy, and then when you're out of college as an artist, you're like, okay, no one's telling me what to draw now, so where do I go from here? And yeah. it's like, oh yeah, I love storytelling, I love illustration, and like I love getting weird, let's, let's start making comics, and that's why I said like about three years ago, it was like, I decided to make my Instagram uh, public and like be like, I'm going to start putting my crap back out there, and it was like, oh, all right, let's do this, I'm going to be an illustrator and make comics, let's see what happens. All right. So, uh... First, why am I your best, most favorite customer? And also, before you answer that, the squeaking is not us farting mostly, um, but it's the chairs that we're sitting in because we are currently, as I said before, in a hotel business center. So Yeah, and you're not going to not roll back and forth on your chair while you're talking. Right, because it's a rolly chair. So, now you can explain to everybody why I'm your favorite customer. Oh, I have to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, because you're the, my biggest fan right now of my, uh, my, my current series, which is just sort of under the name of Apollo, which is the main character of a story I've been writing about just some very human-like robot things, then like, the, my fans of my personal stuff and not just my fan are my, are my favorite fans. Uh. Yeah, so let, let, let's talk about that for a little bit. I don't even have it written in my notes. We're going off notes. We're going rogue. Um, so yeah, you didn't even plug that whenever I gave you a chance to plug your stuff. Tell us about Apollo, now that you actually have a name. I know you're toying with it, but um, that's what you're going forward with. Yeah, yeah, Apollo. yeah, Apollo, yeah, and that, I, did, I decided that one a, a bit ago, but so the thing that I'm playing with is I've created a sort of fun just world of I love to draw robots and I love to draw them covered in cloth and mm -hmm. usually as samurai or others, other yeah. thing. So it, like, that's how I work. I was even just talking to Chris Rao about this, that I illustrate, like, I have an image and I make an illustration. Like, I'd, I'd never have sat down to try to, like, do turns of the head of a character. Like, that's yeah. not how I imagine things. I imagine, like, this cool image in my head of a pose and of a certain thing, and then, like, I build an aesthetic. And so forever, I've been building this weird aesthetic where, like, I'm, I'm not just doodling out my Batmans and other things I do to yeah. practice my anatomy. I will draw these robots and then sort of very organically it's turned into the story of sort of this planet where all of this, like more or less the space missions and things that have gone missing from us in space and are getting, like, just keep landing on this planet. And we think they're just like sort of getting sucked into a black hole or whatever you might call that. Right. But they're really sort of like landing here and then the, the people or whatever you want to call them of this world have had to survive the actual sort of uh, pollution that's also being caused by all the dumping have yeah. used all this scrap to like build all this sort of like makeshift armor around them so that they can like keep living in the things. So. Yeah, I, I think that's, you, you had spoken about um, not doing like head turns and stuff like that, you just draw your picture. I think what you've really done well with the cloth and the wrappings is you create a sort of motion in the stillness of that picture because there's always wind, there's always, I mean it's never just hanging down. Yeah at their feet that's always blowing or wrapping or swirling. Uh, so that's that's part of why I really enjoy it. Um, I'd also like to take a second to uh, talk about my next business and do a little plug here. Uh, legit Arts. What, what are your thoughts on Legit Arts before I explain it to all of my... Well, I guess I should probably explain it first. So <laughs> Legit Arts is something that uh, me and a friend of mine came up with at the behest of uh, Chris Rao and David Fleming here um, because they keep losing money to print farmers because uh, their art is subpar and they can't compete. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just feel so self-conscious about myself that I have to externalize my problems. So. Yeah. 
So uh, print farming is something that they've kind of developed as a saying for, or a code word for these people who go and they steal art off the internet, run it through some filters, uh, and then print off a million of them and sell them, you know, four for $20. And yes. they have the giant booths with all the flashing lights, and it's like the strip club version of... <laughs> Uh, Comic Con, right? That's that's a really good way of putting it. Okay, it's more like it's the uh, it's the flea market back alley version of Comic Con. Yeah, well, what it reminds me of is uh, in From Dusk Till Dawn, whenever they drive up on the one bar in Mexico and it's yeah. got like the giant hooker on there that's all lit up, <laughs> and then it just ends up being a bunch of dirty vampires. Yeah, that's real, and not and this is like one of those things, and this is this goes to my thoughts on this, like. Not every dude you see at a con with the big tower with lights and things is like the con artist dude, but that's why it's so such a thing. It's mm -hmm. you, like an untrained eye doesn't see that this dude selling you this thing and saying he's the only artist who has drawn everything behind him. Where it's like, no, you're not. You know, you're not a master of all of those different styles. That's yeah. not how art works. And like that, and that's the thing. So, yeah. I, so I love the idea of helping the uneducated to be like, dude, I don't care really if you buy from that dude, but just know that dude saying he's an artist is just ripping off other people who are working really hard at right. what they do. So Kent and I have developed a few questions that we want to put into a pamphlet or a flyer or something. Uh, and I'm going to run them by you real quick. Okay. And let me, okay. So the first question is, uh, is the artist who created these pieces here right now? And what, what would their answer usually be if they're a print farmer? So usually, yeah, it's true, they don't say that the artist, they say, oh yeah, no, my, my buddy, he's out of town, or he has a wedding this weekend. Okay. I hear that all the time. I, seriously, like, I, he, he's at a wedding. It's like, for some reason, this yeah. weird go-to thing of like, his buddy's getting married, so obviously he could make it to this one. And you're yeah, like, he okay, should have said yeah. funeral, didn't he? Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so then question number two uh, is... Does the artist who created these pieces have a portfolio or some sketches? Yeah, because or I think that one too can kind of, unless this is also your third question, which is like, do they have a social, do they have a page I can go to? Yeah, that's, that's then, question number three. Okay, yeah, because that's the, the other side Does of the yeah. artist who created these pieces have social media presence? Yeah, because a lot of times what you end up getting is this weird generic business card that says like, Comic Blam Productions, yeah. and then you get on and you're like, what? like this isn't, this isn't even the art that's behind you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I don't know if you notice the common thread between all of those questions, but we like to start off with, is the artist who created this? I mean, that's what we want to focus on, is the artist who created these things. That way, if somebody does come up and they want to, like, fight us because we're running people off of their business, yeah. then they, we can be like, okay, well, which one of these questions offends you? So, and, and I know I've bounced this stuff off to you, of you guys constantly, and you're probably sick of hearing about it, but um, I mean, we're pretty stoked about getting there and helping you guys out because obviously this is nothing but, I mean, I get publicity for all my other stuff, but um, it'll just be kind of a loss and a fun thing to do for us rather than, I'm going to go make money saving, you know, Chris and David's lives. <laughs> well, that's the thing, I, like, I, this thing I didn't even know about when I first started, like, I don't. I can't name the exact podcast or artist that I heard this from, but the word, even the word print farming, I didn't coin that either. Yeah. Like these are things where like I've seen this through like tweets of big comic dudes and stuff. Like I remember, I think it was last year even. There was a big one where, like, there's this famous kind of print farmer guy, and he like straight up had one of the guest artists like art through a filter. Yeah. And the dude was like, "That's my art. Like, take your boots down. Yeah. You are not an artist. This is my stuff." I uh, and I, I was looking on YouTube for like people confronting these guys, and I found like three videos yeah. in all of YouTube, and I'm sure there's more, I just wasn't typing in the right thing, but uh, it was a guy who's taking people's art and putting them on shirts, and so they went and they're like, listen dude, this is my friend's art, like, yeah. it brought the portfolio over, and like, he drew this, and here it is, and the guy was like, well, this isn't my booth, I, I just sell the shirts, I don't, I didn't, and I'm like, all right, well. I mean, what do you do? But, I mean, that's got to be something. You saw your art on oh, somebody yeah. else. Uh, so back to your art. Um, kind of explain your aesthetic whenever you do things, because you have a very particular style, and it works really well for kind of what you do. That's actually a really good question, because this, this has been very fresh in my mind of what is my aesthetic, because 
like, like I was saying, I, I'm very formally trained in terms of like I could sit down with a pencil and I could just like photographically, you know, realistically sort of just copy something, mm -hmm. but like that's not fun. Right. But at the same time, I'm definitely not a super cartoony artist. Yeah. There's like a there's like this fine line I like to balance between like this sort of one or two spots on the page being like almost hyper real and right. then and then the rest of it being like simplified. And like you said, like fl free flowy and like maybe the, like a sort of assumed line of a fabric thing covering up a piece of the arm or a right. chess piece. But then, yeah, so it's it's that it's that sort of like I don't know, maybe there's like a fun way to name that, but it is it's the Yeah. It's the realistically illustrated. Yeah, uh, you just did the uh, realistic Morty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I love that. That's one of my favorite things to do is to find like a very flat character, yeah, and then like give them a, an actual brow line and like like edge their face out the yeah. way it should be. What you should do is uh, just to fuck with them a little bit is take Rouse pieces that he makes and then just draw them in your aesthetic <laughs> and set him up in a booth right, right next, next to him. Right next to him. Put him like right at the bottom of them. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's not actually his. Yeah. Like, yeah, that just no, slid over to his side yeah. of the table. <laughs> I don't know how he'd feel about that. He'd probably get. I'd be fine with it. Actually, he, that would be kind of fun for him to draw a minor character in his. Yeah, you guys should do that. Swap, would, yeah. swap aesthetics for a little while. Yeah. Or not swap, swap characters. He takes your characters and draws them his way because yeah. he does have a very cartoony. Everything's hyper realistic. Yeah, you know, like you're not hyper, hyper stylized. Yeah. Like, like yeah, actually, that, that's kind of real. It's, it's and he put so we both are following the same edge, and he likes to push towards the cartoon, and I like to push just slightly towards the real. Yeah. All right, so uh, if you hear papers shuffling, I do have notes, and they're still in the notebook, so that's kind of where I'm going with that. I'm also flipping through uh, the comic book as we go um, so that we can both see it and know exactly what I'm talking about. So let's dive in. Uh, issue number one, um, I love that the first page started off with a dog taking a giant dump on the side of the highway. Uh, that's just when you know it's going to be a great story. Um, also, um, what is it? Plop, yes. yes. Yeah, the, the first words you read in the comic are plop. Yeah, uh, Kent and I talked about that. We had, hey, he was real excited to read the comic for all the sounds, like the kaboom yeah. and whoosh and stuff. And so to see, you know, plop be the, <laughs> be the first thing. Um, so right now Jason Aaron has this dog taking a crap on the side of the road. Uh, there's a road sign that's all tilted, grass is growing, but behind the dog are three different uh, church signs. What, I mean, where, where do you think Aaron's trying to go with that right here? Oh, I'm definitely just trying to set up the, we are in the South and everything is a bunch of crap, but <laughs> at least yeah. like, it's that, that's that aesthetic and that's, that's why I love this book too. It has that, uh, like the way, even the way it's illustrated and drawn, everything is just sort of very like to use the term like redneck and yeah. all with a purpose. Yeah, for sure. Um, throughout this whole entire trade, and I don't know about book number two, uh, but throughout book number one, this dog keeps showing up. Uh, the same one that's pooping, he's always around, he's pooping in other places or he's growling at people. Um, so does the dog represent something or is he just a character that I, I actually noticed that too, um, right after the way it sort of all ends. Yeah. I was like, wait, this, I just keep seeing this dog. It's, yeah. And then, and then I actually, I, I threw out this interesting theory in my brain that like the main character of the book, first book is actually this dog. Yeah. And we're not seeing it through the eyes of who we think we are, or we actually have just been following this, what this dog has been seeing yeah. kind of thing. Because if you go back through, it's almost like the viewpoint we're getting of all this is maybe actually the dog following this thing, and I thought that was a fun. Yeah, and I, I thought it was funny that the story begins with the dog taking a crap, and the story ends with the dog taking a crap. Like not at the very last page, but it just right there. Yeah, the right. Yeah, that, that's right. So he kind of he kind of books bookends it. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Jason Aaron didn't think it'd do too well, and he was just saying it's a little bit crap. I mean, that's also real. <laughs> I've, I've had a couple of conversations with him, and he definitely seems like he could put something like that into it. Yeah. <laughs> So the main character, unless your theory is accurate, uh, <laughs> is this old dude. We're never really told, I don't think we're told how old he is, but he's got a friend yeah. that he went to high school with who's about 60-something, and this dude definitely looks older than 60-something. Um, so, I mean, maybe around early 70s, would yeah, you I, say? Yeah, 60-ish is where my brain was at, too. Yeah, um, so... 
personally for me, it's hard to get into stories where like the main character or hero is a small child or an old person or something like that. It's just, it's hard for me to like, oh yeah, this dude's going to kick some ass, right? Yeah. Uh, even though, you know, I love Gran Torino and that was an old dude who was just driving around who didn't give a shit about anything and beat the crap out of people, right? Yeah. You just but, that's it. In the podcast, guys, that's this book. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, the way... Did it just stop on me again? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're okay. still recording. All right. I got something popping up because, I don't know, internet. But the way that uh, I explained it to somebody was it's Walking Tall meets Gran Torino. So dude walked around with a stick, beating people up, and then an old dude. And then yeah. <laughs> Age the guy in Walking Tall. Yeah, so, I mean, is that something that you look for in a story? Like, you want the big, strong, stereotypical hero, or do you like more of these, oh, it's either a small child, or it's an old dude, or it's somebody who's not your stereotypical hero? I mean, right, the, the Mumford and Sons in me obviously loves the... Right, odd, but the odd hero is my favorite. But vegetarian hippies can't do anything. Exactly. And then when they do, you're like, oh, shit. No, they don't. <laughs> they're, they're the first ones to die. And, and then they don't. That, that's how you build a good story. But it's fine because I've heard that you were, you're more hipster than a hipster. Like, you were a hipster when hipster wasn't cool. So, then, so I, I, get a, I get a pass. Yeah. I mean, but no, I, to, to be real, though, I, I was actually on the same page as you from probably the first, like, first um, issue of the volume, I was like, I don't really know if I'm going to love that this is my guy. Like, this old dude is my hero was a little strange at right. first. But then it, 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 like, the payoff of who he becomes and who he is is yeah. like, yeah, dude, like, I, I, would, I don't even care if it was like, it was like a built bodybuilder muscle dude. I would not have been surprised at how awesome he became. Just, yeah. It made it all the more satisfying that it was the old man. Yeah, um, so going back to like it having a walking tall vibe, it, it definitely pulled from several of these like movies and stories. Does that help or hurt it? Do you think more or less of the story because it kind of follows that line of storytelling? No, I think it helps it. It's like storytelling. It, storytelling does have rules. You know, you gotta you gotta capture one sort of trope and you gotta, you gotta right. pull in on that. So. Uh, let's see. Um, the first few pages, I mean, he's talking to somebody on a cell phone, and we don't figure out who that is. Um, and sorry, the way I wrote this out, I write these out as I go. So, like, I don't even really know the answers to the questions that I'm writing. So, just kind of answer the questions as it were when you read through. Um, who did you think he was talking to on the phone? I thought he wasn't calling anybody. You thought he was just talking to I thought himself. he was leaving like voicemails on like a dead friend's phone or something. So that, that was okay. my original theory like from the beginning. Okay. Uh, I was thinking either um, dead wife, who he would call her phone, yeah, exactly. just because he liked to listen to her, and then he would talk to her. And So I thought it was one of those things where he felt like he was talking to her, and then he just said, call me back. Um, and I don't, I guess Dead wife was my first option too, and then yeah. when we found out more of the military history thing, yeah, and I was like, yep, this is probably like buddy who died over yeah. the war. Yeah, see, I, I kind of went that way too. Um, so throughout here, there's not a whole lot of talking other than on the phone. Um, I I really enjoyed, like you can see on here, he walks up to his house. Uh, there's a grave, um, and his dad had said that whenever he died. It just says, here was a man. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, you can tell that the, the relationship wasn't great. Yeah. I mean, he's not buried in a nice graveyard. It is kind of nice that you buried him at home, but if you bury your dad, it's going to be like, here was a man, right? Or you capitalize man or something like that. Like, here was a man. <laughs> the, the man. Yeah, the man. Um, but I like all the flashbacks because his dad was kind of badass. Yeah. Right? I mean, he's carrying, he's, his son's peeking out the door, uh, and he's telling his kid, he's telling Earl, get back in the house, uh, and he's got this stick, and you can see people in the background who are, I'm guessing, not going to want to go play jacks. Um, With baseball, they're just, they're just like, stay stick inside, ball. kid, stick we're going to play yeah. a couple rounds here. You're not allowed. <laughs> Nobody would pick you anyway. Um, so, yeah, what do you like it when comic books flash back like that, or would you rather it just be... 
you know, awesome. straight storytelling. I love a good flashback. Yeah? Yeah. I, li I like the, so that sort of, like, TV shows do that thing a lot, too, where you, you're, you get this present image that gives you a feeling, then you get this explanation of the feeling that then changes yeah. the feeling for you. So it's like you get a double experience of the current event because of that. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, my fa I hate just stupid exposition, right? Like, he walks up to his dad's gravestone. Well, you were a tough guy whenever you were sheriff and you used to beat all these people up. And, I mean, he could have done that. Yeah. He could have walked up and just gave his dad's life story, but instead, all throughout the book, it's just flashback here, flashback there. These dudes have a gun. He's beating the shit out of people. And it's all kind of running concurrent with what he's doing oh, yeah. in his life. So I, I, I thought mean, it was beautifully done. That's rule number one is to show, not tell. And I mean, what do you even expect from Jason Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's got a lot of good stuff up there. Yeah. I mean, Thor is probably, other than this, is probably my favorite. And that's, that's actually like why I love Jason Aaron, because he, he, he makes the indie stories, but he also writes for the big two. Right. So his big two stories get that feel and aesthetic of yeah. like an indie comic, because he, he has that same kind of storytelling. Right. So we, we see him, he goes to the, the grave, and then you have more flashbacks, and he's kind of walking through... I believe it's his uncle's house. His uncle had taken over after his dad died, yeah. and he left. Uh, and we'll find out later why he left. Um, but he's just kind of going through. Do you think... I mean, I know he doesn't like his dad, but do you think he kind of holds him in higher esteem because of how he lived his life? I mean, yeah, there's, it's, it's definitely one of those, uh, like, I hate... The, I, I, like, the man you were was, all, was awesome, but the father you were was terrible kind right. of thing. Yeah, and that's how, it seems like that's kind of how people remember him, too. It's like, yeah. oh, your dad was a tough son of a bitch. Yeah. Like, you must be, too. And he's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Um, but, yeah, the, the, first, the first whole book, there's not a whole lot that goes on. He comes into this town. He's cleaning the house, sees his dad's grave. Uh, he goes to eat some ribs. Some ribs. Right. And then uh, one of his old high school buddies comes out, clearly strung out on something. <laughs> um, and at first he's all nice and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden he goes, you just need to get the hell out of here. Like, don't do this. Get out. I know you. I know your dad. I know how you guys are. Get out. Yeah. Um, so what, I don't know, what, why is he, why is Jason Aaron kind of drawing this town? To, like, how does, my, my big question throughout this whole thing is how does a town get this bad? Yeah, that, that's, I don't have the answer for that either. That's the real. Did, where, I think it's the, the feeling is like that thing you hate is actually the thing that's making it right. You know, right? I think that that was definitely the trope of the whole first book was that that so they everyone sort of just even though they looked up to his dad as like the tough guy, yeah, they also all hated him for the sheriff that he was. But yeah. it was like as soon as you lose that thing that you think you hate, then it's like everything just goes downhill from there. Right. And so, and it's it's almost immediately like, it's not that uh, coach boss is the bad guy. It's not that uh, these kids and coaching staff that are participating in all this are the bad guy. It's almost like the town is an entity of itself, and. Uh, as soon as he gets in, as soon as Earl gets back to town, the town starts trying to push him out like he's some sort of virus. Yeah. Right? Because Earl hasn't said anything. He goes, I'm just here, I'm eating ribs. And this dude comes up, hey, how you been? Get out. So it's just immediately, I know your dad, this is how it is, so you've got to be exactly like him. So it was just, it's funny how this whole thing is set up to where the town is like just this evil presence. Did you ever read me like Stephen King? Anything like that? I mean, growing a up? few. Okay, so he wrote a book called Desperation, and it's a lot like that. There's just this town, this evil thing is settled in there, this rot, and it's kind of taken over, mm -hmm. and that's what it's doing is just eliminating anything that's a threat to it. I, I, I cannot. I was trying to do the whole time you're saying that. I was trying to pull something in my brain, too, because I know there's... Like, I've read this trope before, too, and I, I like that analogy you made of it, which is, like, that he's trying to heal this thing that doesn't want to be healed. Yeah. It's like, like he well, and even, even he's not, though, at first. He's, he doesn't care. Yeah. But then he sees this crackhead, or meth, I'm guessing meth, for the way he looks, <laughs> where they're located in the country. Uh, I would say it's meth. Um, 
I mean, he could have just walked out. Yeah. Left his business. Let it be. Because you know this guy deserves it. This dude who walked up, you know whatever he's getting, he deserves it. Uh, and so, but whenever Earl hears him yelling, help, help, and then that last help, you can see the, the panel goes red, and the red panels are what they use for a flashback. Yeah. So why does that panel go red whenever he's walking out? And he that was like the it. moment he became his father. Yeah? You think so? Yeah, that was like the, like, it, because up until then, all the red panels was visions and scenes of his dad. Yeah. And this was like the I'll never be you thing, and then it was like, oh, well... Too late for that. Yeah. I'm going in. And then he goes back and beats the shit out of this dude with the fryer. <laughs> with the fryer. <laughs> I just, as as I was reading it, because they have it, like, in the background, and you see it, and then he finally just grabs the handle, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be straight out of the Watchmen when Rorschach like, flips yeah. the fryer on dude's face. They didn't go that far, but, I mean, he's definitely... I, 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 was, I thought that, that dude should have been a little bit more messed up than he was. Yeah, he pulls some hot, a whole pan of fries and the the fry basket out of yeah. the fire. Oh shit! Nice. There's the car alarm, guys. <laughs> Robbery. There it goes. And he's gone. All right. At least the car's not here anymore. Um. So yeah, I think I'll just leave this stuff in the podcast. I know you were talking about like editing this stuff out, but it makes it more real. Yeah, my, that's, once I get better and yeah. have a higher quality there you go. audience, yeah, keep telling maybe, yourself that one. Yeah. I mean, once I get to maybe five or six listeners. Yeah, let's go for eight. Um, okay, so he saves this dude, and even the guy's like, listen, you shouldn't have done that. That was a bad yeah. idea. Listen, I told you to go. You should have let me take my lumps. Uh, should have let whatever happens, happens. Um, so even he's not grateful. Uh, so he gets home. Earl gets home. Uh, there's a four-wheeler and a kid. Kid's climbing up in the tree. Um, and why why is Earl so, you know, upset about this tree even existing? Because it was like he made the comment that, that a tree grew where his dad's grave was. Like, okay, so they they buried his dad, and they buried him with the stick that he beat the shit out of people with. Yeah. And then a tree grew out of the grave. And this kid's climbing on it. Um, what? Well, where's Where's Jason Aaron going by? Because the kid's like, this is a great climbing tree, <laughs> great tree to climb on. I love climbing on this tree. So what's that? How's that represent Earl's dad? And why does that fact piss him off so much? Well, we just had the scene of he just became his dad, uh-huh. but he hates his dad. And then he's like, well, I guess I should care that you're like climbing over my dad's grave. But at the same time, like, I probably don't, but I feel like I'm supposed to care. Yeah, I think that's the vibe I got there, which is like, and then the kid, like, the kid was like, but it's a strong tree. And it was like, well, yeah, that was also my dad. Like, he yeah. was the strong guy in the town. Right. He supported the town. I also love this kid's t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got some of the best t-shirts. He's got the Kool-Aid man uh, with the Colonel Sanders glasses and goatee on, and it just says sweet tea. <laughs> just some of the greatest stuff ever. Uh, so the guy, the kid leaves, takes off that night. Um, he makes another phone call, and he's talking, uh, and he's saying, you know, give me a call. Uh, I never told you much about my dad. I'll let you know whenever we get there. And that's kind of whenever I start thinking, not so much, buddy. But I start thinking oh, right. that he's alive, with whoever it is that he's talking to. Um, so he gets the axe out. And he goes, presumably, to chop down the tree. And uh, interspersed, you have the football team, who's made up of a bunch of giant friggin' high school kids. <laughs> I know. Like, massive high school kids uh, chasing down the meth addict, who, I guess, stole a bunch of money from Coach Boss. Uh, so they're chasing him down as he's cutting down the tree. Um, and I really like this page right yeah, here. Yeah, it's like literally my it favorite page. It goes chop, and then it goes back to a flashback, and then beating this guy up, then the stick flashback, then chop, then flashback, and it's just going through all these things. Like, why have all three of those things happening right here on this one page? I can't explain it. Can't explain. Can't explain. It. No, I'm just kidding. I, it's just like one of those like great like these three things all happening in tangent with each other kind of things. Mm-hmm. And that, I don't know, it's just really great, like, motion, and, like, 
you could we could have had like a fun little fight scene here, you know, we could have had like just a single smack or whatever, but yeah. there's just like this impact of like every chop of the tree is also a smack to the face of, of the of right. his buddy and at the same time it's also like a memory that he has of his dad and how much he like loves slash hates slash doesn't slash does kind right. of and then like and then that like also just like plays right back to the dude that he saved was like grateful, not grateful. Yeah. It's just like it's taking all these like story moments that we've all had all with the same trope and like placing them all together. Yeah, one thing I think Jason Aaron does really well is he writes enormous stories but paces them in such a way that he can also write a fantastic, you know, five issue series. Because he's referencing stuff here that doesn't get brought up for another three issues. Yeah. Right? All of a sudden, there's just some dude in the army. And then, you know, his dad's holding a holy Bible. As far as I know, they never even talk about the religion aspect. I mean, right? minus our first page, right? Yeah. I Which mean, is that assumption that we're in the South, so every dude yeah. goes to church. Well, and they reference uh, the main, the kid who got hit with the friar, uh, his dad is the preacher. Preacher, yeah. But that, I mean, that's all the, that's all the more you ever hear about religion in this thing. And, you know, it's built up to be one of those big, huge pieces. Uh, it takes me back to Thor. They're 40 some odd issues in to the mighty Thor, and that's where Jane Foster takes over. And they're still pulling pieces from God of Thunder that he wrote way back whenever he did Gore the God Butcher, which was like a hundred issues ago. <laughs> So, I mean, just for him to, the way he storytells, he's got to just have a massive wall. Yeah, I, I was actually thinking about that, too. Like, it's his ability to, like, that every, and everything matters, I think is the best way of putting it. Like, every thing he puts in every panel right. has a specific, distinct purpose. Like, he's not just throwing, like, a thing in there in the background or, like, a panel in because he needs to fill space. Like, yeah. you will see it again, and it does matter. So, it ends with... The top scene is just this dude getting the crap beat out of him by all these football players. Uh, the meth head, not Earl. Uh, Earl's chopping down the tree, uh, and then it zooms into um, his dad. Uh, Bertrand Tubb, here was a man. And then just like one last chopping sound. Uh, I thought he was going to take it down. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Whenever I got done with the first one, I thought he was going to take it down. But you find out, very first thing in the next issue, he just gave up. So I, I get that he's old. I get that it's a big tree. Um, it looks like a hedge tree. I don't know that they ever say what kind of tree it is. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever tried to cut down hedge. Um, no, but it is super hard. It tears up chainsaws. It's impossible to get through almost. Um, I can't say for sure that's what it is because I'm not an arborist. But why would why did he why did he give up? Why did he stop? Well, I just another chunk of symbolism towards yeah. him and then his relationship with his dad. So you think he gave up because he'll never be able to chop down the legacy of his dad, or because he's old and his dad was just too big of a dude? Both. Yeah. <laughs> All of the above. His dad makes great fertilizer. Yeah. Is that what it is? That's it. Um, let's see. So, my next question is, um, because Earl ends up, he's still packing everything up, and for some reason, he decides to go to a football game. Now, for somebody who hates this town, who knows he just pissed some people off, why does Earl go to a football game? Because what else is there to do on a Saturday in a tiny town in the middle of the South? Right, but he hates this town. <laughs> like, if I walk into a bathroom and somebody just destroyed the bathroom, I don't want to be there. I'm not going to stay there. I'll go find a different bathroom. <laughs> How many small towns could he go to to watch a football game? I, that's, that's a funny analogy, but I don't think it was like... It was like <laughs> he used to play on the team, you know what I mean? Right, but it's not, it's not the team he played for. It's not even the town that he considers his town. Anymore. I'm not a sports dude, so I don't, I don't really know how to take that, the analogy, but I'm pretty sure that's like a thing. Like, I think if you, if you played for that high school or that team, I think there's definitely like a nostalgia of that thing, regardless of who's in charge or who currently plays for the team. Okay, so you think it's just he's remembering the good old days? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, he has to, it's more like, a, I have to stick around this town for one more day, 
Yeah, and I, I, the one, everything that I used to remember this town has gone to crap. So yeah. I, I, let's see maybe, if these football is still good. Maybe football's the same. Yeah. Okay. Why is this little kid so obsessed with Earl? <laughs> I think maybe this little kid is one of the few kids in the town who knows that the town has gone uh -huh. down the hole. Okay. But he, he's way too small to have ever made any kind of comment or do anything about it. Right. How does he have such good insight into Earl's life? Because he comes up to Earl and he goes, why are you here? He goes, I'm here to watch football. What else is there to do? It's like you said. He goes, that's not why you're here. You're here to see him. And he's talking about Coach Boss. I think it's more of the, um, like, you want you want the, the wisdom and the knowledge from a character to come from the least expected character. Okay. Like, you could have had, like, the old wise man sitting on his porch being like, ooh, you're back in town. No, yeah. say a wise thing. But instead it was, like, the half-dumb kid right. saying the things he knew he needed to tell himself. Yeah. Uh, for a little while, I played with the fact that the kid didn't exist. And then, you know, I thought maybe Earl was going crazy, making phone calls to himself, and then he's talking to this kid who just happens yeah, to be happens on his dad's yeah. tree. Gets let in to just watch TV. Yeah. And with that. yeah. We find out later that the kid's very real. <laughs> um, but That's not the worst little theory, though. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was because it was somebody who, I mean, they kind of look the same. They have the same shape, nose. They're... You know, both goofy kids. Um, and he's telling him all of his deepest, darkest secrets. Like, you know, you could have left. You could have went and found a motel right on the other side of the county line and nobody would have batted an eye. Yeah. But instead, you came to the most public place <laughs> in this whole county. People drove forever to get over here to watch this game. And then you show up after what you did to the one guy that everybody knows that you don't mess with. Um, so yeah, it, it was just, and it's kind of, it goes back to the dog too, uh, where the dog is imparting some sort of wisdom on us. <laughs> uh, you know it's a shitty county. Yeah. I mean, Plot. you also know that it's a county that's shrouded in religion, that's shrouded in southern tradition of football and going to church and meeting up afterwards for barbecue um, but then the dog gives us great insight into, you know, Earl and how this whole place works. Uh, I was not expecting, uh, old dude to walk out onto the football field. Yeah, that was, I love that uh, scene. All bruised and bloody. And then, <laughs> and then they, uh, after they tackle him, they pick it up and are like, do we, do we still get the ball? Still <laughs> yeah, ball? That's my favorite comment. Do we still get our ball? <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I could say, like, I'm not a sports guy, but, like, uh, I do help out with, like, the high school football games. Yeah. And that thing, ha that, that, like, scene literally made me laugh out loud because it was, like, a, the only thing that matters at a high school football game is the thing happening yeah. at that game. And it was, like, I know I'm covered in this dude's blood, but that, we still get that, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> that, that counts, right? We're good. So, uh, Coach Boss is another just old-ass dude. And so it's kind of setting up for like a grumpy old men situation here. Yeah. Um, I was not expecting. I was expecting when they were talking about Coach Boss, uh, I thought he'd be some middle-aged, you know, giant dude who was also into, well, we don't exactly know what he's into. <laughs> uh, we know it's probably illegal. Yeah. We know he has his high school football team trying to kill people. Uh, and we know he has large sums of money that people are stealing from him. Uh, other than that, he, I, and I really like that part because you're down south, you're in a very poor part of the country, very poor part of Alabama from what it looks like, this small, close-knit community, uh, and then Jason Aaron says, you figure it out. Right. You, I'm giving you all the pieces, you form your own public. You're not dumb enough that I need to spell it out for you. And he does that with a lot of stuff. I think it's great writing. Um, but even even with all of this stuff going on, uh, what is this dude's name? The guy who got hit with the frying with the fryer. Do you remember what his name is? Yeah, man, Na names slip out of my brain with real life people. So I, I yeah, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm terrible with names, but. Uh, this dude just thinks he's hot shit. Oh, yeah. And who, okay, if they were to make a movie out of this, who do you have playing that character? That's a bad question for me, man. You don't watch we, movies? We just got done talking about how I don't remember names. 
You don't have to remember names. Tell me anybody. Okay, so the guy, just from the looks, uh, did you watch Pacific Rim? First one? A long, long time ago. Okay, did you ever watch uh, Sons of Anarchy? Yeah. Okay, that dude. I don't know the name. Looks, yeah, you don't have to, but you know what I'm talking about. Blonde dude. Oh. Who played Jax. I was thinking of the other guy. No, not Ron Perlman? That's, yeah. The old guy? Yeah. To play the kid with the rebel tattooed across oh, his face? I was thinking about Boss. No, forget that. I don't know who plays that dude, but the kid who keeps getting his ass kicked. Gotcha. I can't think of his name. Um. The, the preacher's son. Uh, all right, let me let me get back to my questions because I got kind of sidetracked. Yeah, you got me. Like you, there are three. Th there's two things you can ask me about, man. Like <laughs> sports and names of actors. Like that's just not my thing. Yeah. So uh, I guess I didn't get too far off. Uh, Earl goes to talk to the sheriff. Sheriff kind of waves him off. Earl notices there's a football sitting on the top of one of the file cabinets, um, and he says, you know. I see you play football. You yeah. play for Coach Boss? And he goes, yes, I did. Um, he's like, sorry, I even, sorry, I even yep. tried. <laughs> I'm sorry for wasting your time. So it's understood that Coach Boss and his players uh, are criminals of some sort. Um, the sheriff is in his pocket. Do you think this sort of open corruption actually happens? Oh, definitely. Yeah? yeah oh, yeah. Like I definitely think that this this story definitely is not like a far off from things probably happening yeah. right now somewhere in a town. Yeah, I mean we hear things all the time like uh, you know a hundred police officers involved in some sort of you know ring where they're getting paid and everybody's getting their money. Yeah. Um, but it always gets busted, right? This is a this is a countywide understanding that everybody has. Um, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've I've heard stories, but then you never know what's urban legend and what's real. And then you see movies, so right. it makes it like, oh yeah, this sort of thing doesn't actually happen. Um, but what? Okay, so put yourself in this county. What do you do? Move. Move. You <laughs> yeah. just leave. Yeah, man. Okay. I I am that guy. I'm the guy who's like, and the kids like, why do you? I'm like, oh, you're dude, you're right. I'm out. Yeah. Why am I here? Okay. So away. what is what is Coach Boss providing this county other than good football? That's it. That's it? Right there. So football's enough to keep an entire county happy and turn the other way? That's why I move. Because football's not enough to make me happy for any of you. So, I mean, that, that was the thing is I know how crazy people get about football, especially like down in Texas and Alabama and stuff like that. But it was just, it was one of those things where I'm like, would it be enough for an entire county to just be like, yeah, it's all right what he's doing because for one, we're probably getting some of this money. As in, as, that's the real reason. Like I joke about the football thing. Yeah. But yeah no, I mean, it's obviously mutually beneficial for everybody to just sort of like let him do it. And yeah. then there's the like, well, it's not, I'm not the dude getting beat to death. Right. I stay out of his way. Yeah. As long as I mind my own business. Yeah will be fine. Um, so at this point, uh, Earl's in the parking lot and he walks out of the sheriff's um, and the dog's there and he's growling and barking. Uh, I thought, and it's kind of threw me because I was like, man, I thought the dog was like on Earl's side, but now it's growling at him. So I didn't know if he had like turned, but I put two and two together that he was growling at like these dudes coming up. Why didn't they just like beat the shit out of Earl right there? make an example of him. I'm trying to remember the scene on this one. So they're right here and he just tells them to get out. They just say leave. He goes, I want you to do something, but, uh, you know, just get out of here. Yeah, I don't know. I actually kind of had that same thought too because we already know that the sheriff doesn't care. Right. They, they could And boss knows who he is. Yeah. Boss knows what's going on. I mean, that would have been a short book, you know? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you could have done it. Well, there's a buildup of, of suspense. Because up to this point, like, he had stood up and he smashed him with the fryer, right? Yeah. But we're, like, not really actually sure how capable this character is except for, for like, the one yeah. shot kind of standing up for the dude kind of thing. Do you think it's just a, uh, my guess was, like, an understanding that who your daddy was, it's best if we just shoo you away mm -hmm. rather than escalate this. Because if you're anything like him, it's going to be 
tough battle. Oh yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there was definitely a little bit of fear on on their side of like, yeah, it, it's. I, I'm gonna act like I want to, but it's probably easier for both of us if we settle this peacefully. Right. Uh, so he gets he gets ready to leave, and then he gets back out of his truck, uh, and he just starts cussing at his dad, saying, you know, I don't want to be you. I don't want any of this. I never wanted to be you. I wanted to be the exact opposite of you. Stop giving me your life. Stop trying to put this on me. Um, and the closest thing we get in the entire book to like a supernatural occurrence is lightning comes down and strikes the tree, and then sticking out of the charred remains of the tree. Famous baseball. Is that. a stick, yeah. <laughs> the Louisville, no, it's not a Louisville stick. But just a giant stick. And so he blames his dad for the lightning strike, and then he stands up. Well, he even makes a comment, is it before? I think he makes it before. It's like, is this a sign or something, right? Yeah. Or is it, and then that after, he's like, oh, are you kidding me? That ain't possible. Yeah. And then he picks up the stick, and it's still on fire. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. So, well, let's see, where was I? Um, so the part of that whole thing, too, is that's the rumor how his dad got the stick. So his dad got a stick out of the tree that got struck by lightning, and so then he gets a stick from a yeah. tree that's struck by lightning. So out of this whole thing where it's trying to be realistic and stuff like that, why is Jason Aaron now peppering in some possible supernatural? Well, I think this is the, like, you had that scene of, like, the dudes being, like, let's fight, and he's, like, he's, like outnumbered, and he is an old man. And uh -huh. at this point, they could probably just like whoop, like beat him down half to death and leave him. But then he gets this, and you're like, oh, it's on. Yeah. Next time he sees those dudes, it, uh, he is going to So this is, this is just nail in the coffin, I'm going to be my dad. Yeah, I um, know. Yeah. This is this. Is and you, needed, you still needed a reason. Like at this point, there, he, he, I mean, he stood up for his friend or whatever, uh, and like, but he, he can still, his, he's still in his like, I was going to be here for two days anyways, you yeah. end up. Now he like he gets the bat and it's like now now there's that believability of like what he's gonna do next because there's yeah. another reason there too right he has no reason to start to make this bigger than it had to be rather right. than save the guy and that yeah. kind of thing so he this is just confirming what he deeply wanted to do yeah. anyway like deep down he wanted to stay here and he wanted to fix everything uh, because as much as he says he hates this county I mean this is where he grew up this is he played football here he did all these things. Um, so Jason Aaron is used to uh, riding these giant, crazy, outlandish superhero, you know, comics, you know, Thor and uh, the Avengers and stuff like that. And even whenever he wrote the Goddamn, I mean, that was there's a lot of supernatural, extra crazy stuff. So why do you think he decided to write a piece that was just an old dude who was going to take care of some business with a piece of lumber? I, I don't know, I think it's because I don't think a lot of dudes get into comics just wanting to write other people's characters. Uh -huh. And I think this is just like you finally have that chance to be like, I've got this story burning inside of, a, of a, yeah. to tell like a little more of that slice of life, that thing that I, that feeling or that whatever emotion that I've been wanting right. to tell without having to make Thor be the thing that tells it. Yeah. Which is why I love the stuff that I love. It's, you get... Yeah. You get that, that you get a, you get images, you get the sequences of art, and you get like this beautiful storytelling in the show and not tell, and, and you get it of like, it's like that thing of like I want I don't know if I'd want to read this book, right? But when I read this comic, <laughs> I, it's fantastic. Like you know, it's like you said, yeah. the Kool Aid shirt to the dog yeah. pooping. Like you can't read a book about a dog pooping, but you can read <laughs> a comic and you, and you love yeah, it. Like for sure. So. Uh, I mean, he's always super busy at Comic Cons whenever he's there, and so I feel bad trying to monopolize him because there's like a million people behind me. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to just pin him down one day and just like talk to him about some of these things, but I don't know. He, he's usually a pretty nice guy. Oh, yeah, he's super him. friendly. Um, I just I hate taking up time like that. I, I always say, oh, I'm going to ask these questions whenever I get up there, and then whenever I do, I'm like, can you sign these, please? <laughs> and then I just walk off all giddy. Yeah. Uh, I get I get all fanboy about it. Um, but I think he'd be just really interesting to sit and like pick his brain about this sort of thing. Uh, so moving on into issue three, um, it's really a lot of flashback right there at the beginning. We see Earl as a young man, uh, and he's taken off to fight in Vietnam. 
which, whenever we think of people leaving to go fight in Vietnam or leaving to go fight in any war, it's like a respectable thing. Right. You know, oh, you know, it's such an honor, I'm proud of you, stuff like that. His dad treats him like crap. Like, oh, you're running away, huh? He's just going to take this opportunity to get out of here. Why is his dad such an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because there would be no story, man. We wouldn't even yeah. read in the book if the dad wasn't, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you could still have it. Like, uh, there have been stories out there where the dad is just this ultra heroic person, but never really connected with the kid and then died. And so the kid always holds it against him. But he's just, like, straight-up asshole. But, actually, I think you did just say it. I don't, I don't think it was that he's just a, like a dick. I think it's more just, like, he, he, he hasn't connected with his son. Does not know. He only understands his, what drives him, and he has no idea what drives his son. Yeah. He says, uh, son, if you want to go halfway around the world just to die, at least be honest with yourself about why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, so, and that's what it is. I mean, and to be honest, Earl is just running away. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and you it's, get, you get it's multiple honest. other panels of him yeah. making the comment. Like, even, I think when he's finally there at war, there's a comment of, like, I'll get you home as soon as possible, and he's like, not if I have anything to do with it. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, so what's that, I know this is kind of going way out in left field, but what kind of commentary is that, that we see him as a dick because of what he said, but what he said was absolutely true. Right. Yeah. So we're supposed to we're supposed to hoist Earl on our shoulders when all he really wants to do is just leave and probably die, and he'd be okay with that, right? And his dad's an asshole for calling him out on it. Um, it, it just it it really made me think, you know, okay, there's probably a better way to deliver it, but maybe not villainize everybody for just being honest. I mean, I think that's what it was. I think. I think you need. I think you need a hero that you doubt sometimes. Yeah. If you have a hero who is all hero, and there's right. there like in every situation he gets into, you're just like he'll make it. He'll make right. it. He'll make it. You can't have. A, I think you can't have a hero in a story who has a perfect personality. And that's yeah. another one of those reasons. It's like I, I. Sometimes I think you read a superhero comic and you get stuck too much on like he's the hero. He's yeah. righteous and like you know Batman won't kill a guy and that kind yeah. of stuff. And you're like, no, that's not real. Like so, dudes make mistakes, and like dudes are gonna make the wrong choices sometimes. Right. So you hate Superman. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I my I read, favorite superhero, definitely. Superman. I've got I've got a story that you should read um, about Superman. I think you'd love it. He uh, he he's gonna go. He has this system set up to where if something like a world's gonna be destroyed, he can go and try to save it mm -hmm. because he doesn't want the same thing happening to his world. If he can't save it, he saves as many people as possible. Well, he takes his son, and he's telling his son, yeah, whenever we get there, they'll probably be, they'll think, you know, oh, man, what's going on? They'll take us to their leader. Uh, they'll be appreciative of us. You know, they'll be confused at first, but then they'll figure out what we're trying to do is good for them. And they get to a planet, and they're like, no, we're, this is our God's will, so we're going to die. He goes, no, you can't do that. Let me <laughs> save you. He goes, and they go, are you telling us that you're better than our God? Who are you? to tell us what we should do. Who are you to tell us that we can't die? Who are you to say that you are smarter than our God? And so it kind of flies in the face of everything that Superman's been because he w it paints him as super arrogant that he can just fly around the universe and decide what's best for everybody. Um, I mean, you just made a huge commentary on how the world works right there. Yeah. Right? Like uh, uh, America going across the country and telling other people what's right. best for them. Like, yeah. This is how you should live your life because this is how we, live, how we live, live our lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, I, I'm a history major and I have a teaching degree as well. And these are the whenever I student teaching, these are the kind of debates that I'd like to get the students engaged in. Is well, why can't this country do this? Yeah. Well, because it's not right. According to who? <laughs> yeah, because we've done it. Okay. Well, I mean. I've done things that you've never done, but that doesn't mean that you should live your life exactly like me. Whenever we do microcosm stuff, it never works out. You have to live your life exactly like me. But then they're like, no, no, that's not right. But then whenever we look at you know, clusters of people, yeah. then it is okay to say it all of a sudden. You can't tell me what to do, but we can tell the entire group of people what to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now, sitting right beside the dad is a dog. Is that the same dog? I, I think so. 
from 30 years ago. Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, you know, it goes to your theory that maybe this dog is some sort of... Uh, I, I think maybe it's like a... Um, you, you could probably at least put it in your brain that it's a mutt of... Like, a, you know, it's somewhere in the right... What's that? What yeah. do you call that? A litter? Yeah. Of this, Just the offspring? Yeah, yeah. It's somehow the offspring of the same dog. And then he's genetically imprinted to follow Earl around. Right. Yeah. Because he, he, well, they say those are things that carry through generations of dogs. Could so. be. Well, Aaron makes it a point to have the artist put the dog right there, because as soon as you turn the page, what do you see? First, you see the dog. You see dog poo. Oh yeah, that's right. And yeah. then <laughs> the dog's barking. I mean, so it's this dog has a bigger role to play than no, no, he is the hero, hero of our story. He is, um, and then. Earl just walks right through it. Uh, so this is right after Earl grabbed the stick, right after Earl figured out his calling in this whole thing. Uh, and he goes in... To eat some ribs and break to, some ribs. To eat and break some ribs. <laughs> um, and the dude is there with the rebel tattoo who got hit with the fryer. Uh, <laughs> so he walks in... Um, and he goes, you come back for some of that fried pie, or maybe some more ribs, and, uh, and he goes, afraid not, Shauna. He's like, oh my god. And he goes, I'm going to need more than ribs, <laughs> and he's, as he's rolling up his shirt. And I love, okay, so in comics, I love splash pages, oh, where yeah. it's just covering the entire thing. But I think it also gets used a lot. Um, and so I think Aaron chose this page very specifically to emphasize, okay, I'm here to kick some ass, and take some names, <laughs> and eat some ribs. And eat some fucking ribs. Um, but it, it, this dude, uh, I feel bad for him. I feel real bad. His name's Esau. There we go. That's what it is. Esau. I knew it was some weird friggin' name. Um, Esau talks a lot of shit and gets beat up a lot. <laughs> Just... I think there's even a comment about it later on, about it. Uh, but why is Esau such a punk bitch? I mean, he, he, it's like you said, though, it's that, that's like a... I don't know the reasoning for this one, but that's definitely like a character trope, is to put that guy who's like only as confident as the guy above him. Yeah. It's like the coach boss is his confidence. Like he thinks he's untouchable because coach boss is untouchable and he's his right hand man or whatever kind of thing. But <laughs> just, he's like, without him, he's literally, like you said... Yeah, he's just <laughs> he's, a little punk bitch. This is the second time Earl's beat the crap out of yeah. him. And Earl's clearly not scared of him. So I, I don't understand why Esau keeps coming to Earl and antagonizing. That's not what happened in this uh, interaction, but it keeps happening. Yeah. So, I mean, if you've beat my ass two times already, <laughs> I can't come up to you and talk shit anymore, right? Well, I mean, you can. I can, I can come up and say, hey, <laughs> my boss is going to do something to you. Right. But I can't come up and be like, yeah, you're just a little wussy, or I'm going to beat your ass. You can't do that anymore. Um, my next question is, with everybody in Coach Boss's pocket, how is Earl not arrested? That is, well, I think... I think that's why we went to see the sheriff. Okay. And that earlier, because I had that same comment too. Because, uh, I don't, I don't, is it in this one or is it the next one when he walks past the sheriff? I think it's in the next one. Yeah, he, he like walks past the sheriff and he makes a comment. Oh, no, no, it's this one. And he's like, don't do this. And he's like, say the same thing to your boys, basically. I think the sheriff yeah. knows that like, if he arrests Earl, he has to arrest everybody. Right. Like he kind of has to make no arrest at this point and that's just yeah. like let this thing play out. Okay. So, I mean, it's kind of that mutually assured destruction that Coach Boss was trying to avoid in the first place. Yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> and then we've, we've got the boy that shows back up uh, in his karate chicken shirt. That's the shirt. <laughs> that, I, that, that was my favorite one to cry. When he was like, he was, he, I forgot about the Kool-Aid one. Yeah. I, that's the, I was laughing at that one. I love that one. Yeah. They need, Aaron, Jason Aaron needs to make these shirts right? and sell them at be, Yeah, Kong. I would totally buy that. Uh so the kid comes by, and he's making fun of Earl for talking to a stick. And then he goes, yeah, I talk to the TV sometimes. <laughs> so, I mean, they're both a little... I love, and he keeps making that comment because my mama says the devil lives in yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> the devil lives in there. Um, but, again, he's like, how can I help you? I want to help. I want to do this. 
do you think the kid actually wants to change what he sees as wrong in the universe, or is he just wanting to attach himself to somebody that he was, because he was attached to his uncle. His uncle let him watch TV, yeah. and so now here Earl is. Do you I, well, I imagine his uncle probably had the same values, too. I bet, I bet his uncle sat there while he was watching TV and probably talked about the good old days of yeah. when his brother was still alive, and like, he didn't let that kind of thing happen in the town. Yeah. So, uh, we do get the sheriff in this next panel, um, and Esau actually says, you know, don't go after him. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, even still, everybody saw this happen. Well, he tells them don't arrest him because we want, we want it to, go to, to go further than that. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. It, it just, at some point, you'd think the sheriff's hands are going to be tied, yeah. right? He's going to have to be, and I think he even makes a comment to that, but... Um, I mean, Esau and Coach Boss have a lot of pull because he threatens the sheriff's job. So, again, football. Yeah. Well, football. also, I mean, if the sh if you're the sheriff in this town and you're in his pocket, at some point you're not actually the sheriff. Right. And you can just be replaced with another person yeah. who will put the badge on and just do exactly what you were not doing. One thing I really liked was Esau and uh, the other guy went back to talk to Coach Boss about everything that's happening. And Coach Boss plays it like there's recorders everywhere. He goes, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, I'm hired to do football. <laughs> he goes, you're hired to make sure that I don't have to do anything else except coach football. Yeah. Um, so why is he being all coy about this? I just, man, this just, I, that just makes for a good character. Yeah, like he's he's just, so, just makes him badass. Yeah, well, he's, just, he's, also just, he's just so cocky about how safe he is in this world that he's made. Yeah. So, uh, let me see what my question was. We still don't know exactly what sheriff, uh, or what staff Coach Boss is in, or what stuff Coach Boss is into. Um, if it's drugs, you would think that Aaron would just say so or allude to it a little bit more, because I really have no idea. We've never seen any drugs. Yeah. We've seen a guy strung out. That is, the, that is the only indication that it is drugs. I think it's kind of like you said, though. It's, an, it's one of those things that doesn't, fully matter and maybe it will yeah. as we get into it but like it's better to leave that up to us to just know so it's whatever, just so whatever. obvious yeah, yeah like, it doesn't matter. Matter. this guy's in charge that's all we need to know yeah uh my next question that builds on that which is why i re-asked the question was is it drugs or is it something even crazier that we would never expect i think if we're gonna find out it's gonna be something crazier yeah it's, we're not just gonna be like one you know that scene of you walking in and revealing it yeah we're not just gonna be like packaging heroin that's not that's right. not enough and that also which is there it goes boom there goes your mystery yeah there goes your suspense on who this character is right but instead we get to just like know that this guy is in charge of the entire time. one one theory that i've got is that coach boss is uh trafficking humans through the church i think coach boss has someone above coach boss yeah, like I'm, I'm in my mind. It's a network of multiple small towns being controlled by a larger thing. Yeah, like like a he, conglomerate. Yeah. Okay, and he's just cashing in and running his. Just he's just in. a foreman. He, yep. That's all he, he just wants. He just he just wants to be coach, and this is his way of getting there, right? This yeah. is like the. What what what's your what do you want in life? I'll put you where you need to be, but you have to do what I tell you. So to. that makes sense that this county is being left alone. Yeah, if you have a higher up that's protecting you and insulating your county, then you can kind of run it however you want. Exactly. Because you can keep the feds off me. Um, but yeah, that was that was one of my things was, you know, it's almost so obvious that it's drugs that, that it's it like, can't be. Oh, is he messing with us? Yeah. Is it gonna be? Is it gonna be something else? Because that's exactly what Aaron did with Thor. Right. It was so obvious that it was Jane Foster who was the new Thor. Sorry about the spoilers, but <laughs> we're, he just killed her, so, again, sorry about the spoilers. Uh, well, if you're not, I mean, if you're not read up on it at this point, you won't be yeah. sad to me. Like, right. Um, but it was so obvious that it was her, that whenever they revealed it was her, you're like, oh yeah, whenever I go back, I see it all through here, but I don't see anything, and I've looked, I went back and looked, I, I, and I, yeah. what is it? <laughs> is there like... Do you see, you know, a collar back there that, you know, somebody was chained up with? Or do you see... Cages like, or empty trucks? And yeah, like you, there's like nothing. That. There's no illusion to what it could be. 
Unless he's running Jack Daniels, because that's all that you see. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. He could be steroids as big as his friggin' football team. Right? I love that comedy, <laughs> man, because I love to say That first scene of them beating him up, my yeah. mind wasn't that these were high school kids dressed as fo- It was that these were full-grown dudes dressed like football players, not yeah. these are football players who are actually just like high school kids who are massively beating the crap out of this guy. Right. So... I like that Earl's smart enough to just go stay in the woods. <laughs> after after all this, he just goes hides out in the woods. Um, we can see the battery on his cell phone's dying. Uh, this is this is the scene where I'm like, I've got to know who it is. Oh, on the phone. I've got to know. Actually, this is. was the scene that made me think he's calling nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because he's just out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it was like literally like. This is this, this is the only I have no one left alive in my life. Yeah. So I, this is how I talk it out is what that that scene right there told me. Right. This is also this next page is the scene where we realize that the little boy is not an imaginary little boy. Oh, yep. Um, which I never had the theory, but I after hearing it from you, I almost wish that it was real. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been interesting. Yeah. Uh, so the football team goes in helmets and everything. And if you're going to commit a crime, I get that you essentially have immunity of all crimes in this town, but you're essentially wearing a sign that says, I'm a football player, I work for Coach Boss, right? and I'm committing these crimes in my uniform. Wearing a Boss barbecue shirt. Wearing a Boss barbecue shirt, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, so it seems, it, it could just be Jason Aaron trying to tell us, you know, this is the extent of the corruption, is that... They're openly doing this. Oh, definitely. Wearing the uniform. Yeah. Um, I was not expecting it to go this far. I thought when he the he makes the comment, like, give him a message. And yeah. I wasn't actually imagining them beating the kid half to death. Yeah. I was imagining that, like, the next scene being the kid being like, they said they've got your dad. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that thing. Like, somehow, yeah. somehow they found an alive relative or, I don't know, something like that. Well, and they, they ended this issue shooting the TV, and then saying, uh, send him a message for us. And then you, like, hear him yelling. And so you're like, holy shit, what are they doing to him? I mean, I get, you know, I get that they're beating him. You can see the shadows and stuff. But I was, I'm like you. I was like, you're going to give him a message. We're going to tear up all of his stuff. Yeah. Well, and even then, I think that, that one, is it, in my mind, I remember it being vague enough that it could have just been them beating the house to pieces yeah. and not the kid. Yeah. Well, because he loved the TV, too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, it starts off again with uh, the flashback. Um, I really enjoy the comparisons of Crow County to Earl's time in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I get what Aaron's trying to say is that you know, his dad was fighting a war in the county that he fully expected his son to take over. Mm-hmm. And instead, he went over to fight a war somewhere else. And this is where we get, uh, I'll get you home safe. And he goes, not if I have anything to say yeah. about it. Um, which, in no way does he ever seem like he's suicidal. No. But he is reckless in the sense that if it happens, oh well. Reckless is a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, I also like that this is the first time you see any real emotion out of him. I mean, you see anger, yeah. and you see him longing to talk to whoever it is that's on the phone. Uh, Which is, that, that's also why I had the assumption, so also I had the, why did he finally decide to go back besides that my uncle's dead and now I have to get my right. dad's crap. In my mind it was, no one else is left in the life I decided to take instead, so let me, I'm going to go back to my old life and see what, 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 it's, what it's up to, basically. Right. See if he could maybe insert himself back into yeah. the old life. Um, I, I honestly wasn't expecting this comic to go in that direction at all. I was expecting it to be walking tall. He shows up, sees things wrong, runs for sheriff, becomes sheriff, and then, you know, fighting all these battles. But it... The story goes by super fast, but then it also goes by super slow in the sense that he stretches all these comics out within three days. Yeah. All of this stuff happens within three days. Um, so he, he gets this emotional connection. He sees, you know, this boy is almost dead because of me. It's my fault. I'm the one who did all this stuff. I'm the reason that you got the crap kicked out of you. Uh, 
One thing that I want to know is why doesn't Earl use a gun or a knife? Well, I, I don't, because, I mean, why doesn't, why didn't he beat the guy to death the first time he beat him, right? Yeah. Like, he's not trying to murder these people in any, in any sense of, like, the thing. You know, he's pulling the Batman-Superman thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he doesn't, he's just trying to serve justice and not murder. Right. But, I mean, why not? I mean, this is, this is as close to the real world as you get where, you know, real people are getting hurt yeah. because of actions that you're doing. It's not like a Batman situation where, oh, you know, the Joker shows up just because I'm here, the Joker's here, so I have to bust him. Like, this is, I decided to get involved in something I didn't need to, and now this kid's beat up because somebody was sending me a message. Um, and they also cut his tires, so... And that's, uh, that is one of my favorite scenes of this book, like, this issue. It's when he's like, if you wanted me to leave, why'd you slash my tires? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was real dumb. So, spray paint, get out of the side of my car and yeah. slash my tires. <laughs> you see everybody's huddled up in front of... Uh, Boss Barbecue, um, even the dogs there. Which did you notice the dog has a collar? Oh no, that's a bandana. Dog has a bandana. Somebody, somebody put a bandana on the dog. Did not have a bandana earlier? I don't know. I'm not sure. We should just be able to flip back to almost any page, right? Since he is an error. Let's see. The dog go to Vietnam. Maybe. May yeah. Got the bandana. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody put a bandana on him at some point. Um, but yeah, everybody's there. So everybody is either there to participate in what's about to go down or observe what's about to go down. Why is why is an old man getting the shit kicked out of him so fascinating to an entire town? <laughs> Dude, I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's like, it, this, I, don't know, I think, I just feel like there's lots of commentary in this, in this book also, and this is parts that I like, of just the sort of nature mm -hmm. of, of humans and who we are and what entertains us, because yeah. it's real, it's like, it's like a mob mentality thing, it's like, all right, all right well, it's not Saturday and there's no football, but right. I, I hear, don't know, Bob's barbecue and old dudes are going to get, <laughs> yeah, it's about to go down. Get his face beat in. So, my favorite line in all of this, uh... I think it's on here, um, or it, it might not be on this one. Uh, it might be on the other one. Right here, walking tall scene here too. Is it? There it is. Yeah, that, that where he's walking down with the <laughs> yeah. lumber. I yeah, the lighting in that one too is just fantastic. I, I love the art in this. I, I've gotten to where I used to really love the clean, crisp lines and mm -hmm. the bright colors and the super, you know, hyper defined. He sort of painted around. Yeah, yeah this like, kind of thing. I mean, the DC style. Yeah. Uh, I really like DC, and I still do, and I really like a lot of the Marvel. But even Marvel's kind of switching up some of their smaller ones yeah. to stuff like this. Well, Marvel just seems to be hiring artists under the cuff lately that aren't just the generic ones that have mm -hmm. gone to the school to learn the style. Yeah. Well, and I think, I, I really think that's where they're going with it because uh, Old Man Logan has a style mm -hmm. oh, a lot yeah. like this. Uh, Thanos had a style a lot, like just really rough, muted colors. You don't you don't have to be all bright and flashy to get mm -hmm. the point across. Um, I I thought these two pages right here, where he makes Earl makes this big proclamation of why do you guys just sit around and do this? A boy's in the hospital, a guy's dead. You know this is what they're doing, and they're doing it right in front of your faces. Why are you guys uh, just letting this happen? Stand up, rise up, kick this you know, poison this cancer out of our society, uh, I thought this was going to be the point where the crowd would be like, yeah, enough of this. And then it was going to be like, that's when we transition to the next book. Uh, but instead he gets hit in the head with a rock. <laughs> yep. And I literally, what I, I didn't expect the hit in the head, but I was literally, yeah. I was literally expecting it like, go home. Yeah. So it, and it's you not... You can't go here. At the, yeah. <laughs> At this point, it's not even we're okay with it. It's we're actively participating yeah. in this. Well, I mean, it's the that, that that another commentary that he makes that's great. Like doing nothing towards a problem is actively participating yeah. in it. So that they're already in it. All right. Um, so next question after that is once again uh, in this fight, 
uh, Esau has a baseball bat. Um, and then this is, again, this is the best, best line in the whole thing. Uh, Esau just hit him and hit him in the face with the bat, and he goes, "You listen, an old man." And his dad said that lightning hit, or, East, or Earl said that lightning hit a tree for a reason. Uh, whatever happens next, I'm glad it happened. And Esau's like, "What?" He goes, "I said I'm getting mighty tired of whooping your ass." <laughs> and then he just beats the shit out of him. Uh, and he takes it pretty good too, but he ends Actually, up... Actually, I love this scene because of that. There's a, yeah. there is, there is like a following of the next few panels, and then the, yeah. like the giant 9 grid, or it's even 12 grid, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Or, yeah, like, yeah. you're just like, oh, wait, is he... Uh, yeah. Uh, he's winning this one? He's it's a, this one. Oh. It goes punch, then chopping down the tree, then Esau, then Earl getting his ass kicked, then his dad with the Bible, then the dog, then football, then ass kicked, then... More football flashbacks, and it's going like the flashbacks are just all over the place. Stuff that we haven't talked about. Yeah, hitting it. Uh, Earl being a football player. It even flashes back to the phone almost being dead. Uh, then all of a sudden, there's a bunch of hands grabbing at his dad's uh, stick while he's holding it. Um, and then you get one scene out of the whole thing, or two scenes where Earl's actually kicking some ass, but. It's so, also, to, just to give you guys the visual of this one, because I meant to say this in the last one, this thing where it goes red when there's a flashback, like, th there's like this checkerboard, beautiful yeah. pattern of this, like, zoom back and who cares what's in these panels. Right. Like, this, this flash is beautiful. Yeah, and it, it's amazing that zero words, you get some sound in here, uh, like the chalk and the heavy breathing and stuff, but... Um, Zero actual dialogue, but it tells more of the story than any other portion of the entire, what, four issues that we've read so far? Oh, yeah. And that's I mean, why you said it. It's it like fills a, you in yeah. immediately. Uh, and then the dog. And then the dog. The dog attacks Esau. Uh, then our hero emerges. Yeah. The hero. <laughs> the hero's there. Um, once again, Esau gets his ass kicked. Uh, why did Aaron, again, make him so bitch-made? If he's the number two, he's the number two dude. Yeah. He's not even the idiot that goes out and, like, runs errands, right? Uh, even Esau has a guy under him, but if you're going to get your ass kicked this many times by an old dude... And a dog. Like, how is he... Yeah, and a dog. <laughs> how is he still the number two? I, I, I think it just sort of makes a commentary, too, on the... That, this guy's competence is the most competent he could find. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, okay, so it's one of those things where when you get settled into a groove, you get lazy. Yeah. Also... This is the first person that's ever challenged him. Yeah. I also... This, this goes back to, like, the thought I had because of something you said. It's the preacher's kid. So if a right. box, big boss and the church is in okay. on something together. Yeah, maybe, I never even put those you know, maybe, two pieces Maybe together. this is a literal, you have to make my boy your, your second. Right. Yeah, and it could be. Maybe the preacher is above boss. Yeah. Because we still have, I mean, they're still making these. I mean, that, I've got, they've got two trades past this one out right past, now. Yeah, there's three, four And then they're making, I mean, there's Wednesday. There was just another issue that came Let's out. do this. So, yeah, it's... For it to be this big in this short amount of time, I mean, you this is an entire book's worth of stuff. Yeah. Uh, now, what? it didn't really surprise me, but did you notice that Coach Boss got bigger like in this fight from whenever he was at the uh, football game? Let me see if I can I find mean, it. Like, Art-wise, you mean? Like, it just feels like we've drawn him larger than life. Yeah, so... Well, I think uh, at this point, we, have never, we haven't seen his full body. Like You see oh, him right there. there. You get a you get a pretty good size. I mean, he's yeah. not like a small dude, but right there, he's like the fucking juggernaut, <laughs> just just rushing him. Now, what I also liked was uh, Earl's the kind of guy who doesn't talk shit. Mm -hmm. He just goes in. And he's like, I'm gonna need more than ribs, right? <laughs> but here he comes up to Coach Boss. And he goes, I remember you. He goes, I used to pick on you. You were a little punk back then. Uh, he goes, I could have stopped everybody. I didn't pick on you, but I let everybody. And I just want that to sink in, that I let all of that shit happen to you. So now you're just 
swinging your big dick around here because nobody else has challenged you. Yeah. Uh, but Coach Boss also shows that he's not, you know, Esau. Right. Uh, also, I think he wanted him to hit him first kind of thing, too. Yeah. I think there was definitely a little bit of, like, a... Right. I'm just going to come in here sort of beating you up. Right. Um, let's see. So, how did... Aaron, like you said, Aaron doesn't put anything in here that's not important. So why did he make it a point to say that Coach Boss used to be this puny little kid who got made fun of? He used to be the well, nerd. We just we just put full motive into him of like I the, the comment I made, which is like you know this is all awesome. speculation. So you're the puny kid who got picked on, and then someone comes to you in some way and says I can give you what you've always wanted, just to be on yeah. top make the town run this way. So I, that's what makes me think in some way, shape, or form, like, he, his whole motivation was to be on top because yeah. he's always been on the bottom kind of thing. Right. And I also think that that comment there was more of a, hey, you know how I was kind of in this situation once and I just sat there and let it happen? Yeah. You're doing it now. Right. Like, the whole town is just watching just like I used to watch. Yeah. And I don't know how you feel about, like, action sequences in comic books, but this is one for the ages. Oh, yeah. In my mind. I mean, they're clawing each other's eyes out. The, they're, the way it's, like you said, too, the, the, the non-clean line of this. Yeah. The way the, the sort of, like, the word, the, like, sounds and stuff are, yeah. like, they are, like, the cracking and, like, punching and all those things right. are, like, they, they feel just as painful as the I think, <laughs> impact of the... I think the roughest one for me was... Uh, they kind of zoom in on the end of the stick, and then instead of coming down and hitting him like a bat, he comes down and hits him like he's trying to drive a pole in the ground right in the side of the face. Yeah. Uh, and the artist made it a point to make this all jagged and messed up, whereas, you know, whenever he's walking down the street, granted he was far away, but it yeah. looked rounded on the ends. And then now they're making it a point to be like, no. No. This is messing him up real bad. Tearing pieces of him off. Yeah, that was one of the best fight scenes I think I've seen in many, many uh, comics. I wasn't expecting him to lose. Well, you gotta lose. I was not expecting... I get that... False victory. <laughs> well, I get that, you know, there are more stories to tell. Yeah. And so he's obviously not going to kill Coach Boss. I thought, if anything, maybe the sheriff would step in and, like, pull him apart. Yeah. Uh, and then deal with those repercussions later. And I guess that I'll would start a feud. I'll agree that I, I was assuming he'd lose, but not in the way he did. Right. Yeah. Where Coach Boss just like walks off, and he's and he's could bloody. probably be, be dead. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Jason Aaron, the asshole he is, uh, makes the phone ring <laughs> uh, at the very end, which blows your That's theory right. out. Of well, the water. yeah. Well, because this panel right here. Yeah. And then walking away, it could have just been a splash to end the, into any yeah. issue. No, I, right. Volume one, boom, done. Yeah. But instead, gives you one big middle finger uh, and makes the phone ring. And then he ends it. That's it. Uh, we won't say who it is. Except for the epilogue. Did you not read the epilogue? There's an epilogue? No, I'm just kidding. I read the epilogue. <laughs> yeah, so the epilogue... Uh, I kind of agree with you, I, and I don't know when this was released. I don't know what order it was released yeah. in, um, but they put it with Volume 1. I think the epilogue would have been better suited for issue number one. Like start of issue number yeah, one. Yeah, because then you're just sitting there. I mean, I get that they're still coming out mm -hmm. one month at a time, but uh, I think for somebody who just buys the trades, if I would have ended on that and then the phone's ringing and it says, this is Earl, leave a message, Hey, it's me, and then it's just boom. That's it. Done. On that black page. Yeah. yeah, leave it there, right there, and then start with this, and then you're like, oh, why are you in the army again? And, uh, so it turns out that uh, he's got a daughter, and she's real. She is real. <laughs> Hopefully, this is one. Very... Also, right, either this could be in the past. It could be. It could be like Westworld, I guess. Where like, yeah. you think it's like she's like she's responding to a call that happened. No, I'm just kidding. That's not that deep. I think it's right. definitely he's been calling her the whole time. <laughs> so, uh, does the fact that she's African American have any any significance? Uh, I literally didn't even think about it. 
Yeah? yeah. You just don't see people through that lens? <laughs> I'm not trying to be like that cheesy person, but until you said that, I didn't even think about that. Really? Yeah, not at all. See, and Aaron made it a huge point for it to be set in the deep south. Right. For it to be ultra conservative. Super southern, super... Yeah. yeah super ball every, church Super and... everything you see. And then for him to have an African-American daughter, I'm just like... And it could just be that it doesn't have any significance, and that's just... No, I, I think you definitely are nailing something there with it. I just... Because they had... Well, there was, a, there was a red panel, so he had a flashback of... And I think it was around the time that he was flashing back with his dad and everything, of somebody, like, caressing the face of a black woman. And I didn't know if that was his dad doing that, or if that was him was doing that. Was that his mom or his wife? Or... Yeah, or it could have just been his daughter, and he was, mm-hmm. you know, saying, I love you, or whatever. Um, but I didn't think anything of it. You know, I just thought, oh, you know, maybe his dad hooked up with somebody, and that'll have some significance later on. Uh, but it turns out it was him, and that's his daughter. So I wonder, I, I want to know if that's going to play a bigger part in anything. I, I kind of imagine, and this is funny that we do this on, on, like, on a book that does already, like, there are other people out there maybe listening that already know the answer to this. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, I, I think that would be a good way to come back into book two, is just be like, like imagine the oh, story yeah. of her. It's, it's going to have to be more world building in the second volume, yeah. right? You know, you've, you've told the story, you've got us hooked, now you need to go develop. You need to develop this thing and then tell us where everybody's coming from um but yeah it's it's a crazy ride i was not expecting it to be this good yeah um, I, I would say that i i got a recommend recommended from a dude who like has never given me a bad recommendation yeah but i remember i picked up issue one just at a random con and like kind of flipped through and was like mm, this might not be me and yeah. like i didn't end up reading at the time and then it was like when you were recommended i was like i've been looking to read this for a long time yeah. here's my excuse yeah. Let's do this thing. So, my last question is, if the setting were anywhere but the Deep South, would it work as well? No. It has to be Deep it South. It has to be Deep South. It can't be like New Mexico. Yeah. Because it's already been done. Right. Yeah. A- ABD. Already yeah. been done. Uh, but no, for real, it's like, it's like you said, Aaron does a really good job of showing and not telling, yeah. and putting it as Deep South as he possibly could in the smallest town he possibly could. Like, with the literally, when you roll into town, there's a sign that says, we've won four national championships, kind right. of thing, you know, like, we don't, right. don't have to say anything else. Yeah. We know we know what's on the minds of all the people in this town, right. and the way they think, what drives them. Like, yeah. we don't need to spend any extra time building any of the characters around the right. story, because we know the way they're going to act. Yeah. You, you kind of, you do the world building all at once. Yeah. Um, I think it's very easy to get a mom mentality whenever it's... Uh, a small town, everybody can join and have this shared interest where if you're in like Detroit, you can't share an interest with however many oh, yeah. millions of people. Oh yeah. It's like it's legit that when you're in a small town everybody knows everyone's name. Yeah. Everyone knows everyone's business. Like that's not just a, it's not just a trope or a rumor that yeah. people use. That's real life. All right. So scale of one to ten, what do you give, what do you give Southern Bastards? I'm at a 9.5. 9.5. Yeah. What what makes it a point five? I don't know because in my mind it wasn't a like a perfect book, uh-huh. but it was freaking fantastic. Yeah, it definitely was. Uh, I I'm like you. If this was a book, I don't think it'd be a very good book. Yeah. Like, with it being this, with it being a graphic novel, oh, yeah. it makes an excellent graphic novel. Um, just like if they were to make a movie, I think it'd be terrible. If they were to turn this into an HBO show. It'd be freaking amazing. Uh, Can that's, you imagine? That's rumored. For this? Yeah. See? It's like I'm a prophet. <laughs> and that's what I literally was thinking, actually, because you made the comment who would play them. And, like, I, man, I cannot even explain how horrible I am with trying to come up with, like, an actor's uh-huh. name or a face. But, yeah, like, I can imagine this, like, building this world on, like you said, like an HBO yeah. show. And, and I, see, whenever, whenever I read um, just a book, so say I pick up a Stephen King book. Yeah. Uh... For one, for if I'm going to remember any of it or get into the book, I have to read each character's dialogue in a different accent. Not like this guy's <laughs> going to have a Spanish accent. I'm imagining you in your like, hello, Anthony. Yeah. Like making different voices. No, it's or... not. It's not that. But uh, what what I've learned helps me with that is I'm reading and I imagine 
this actor would be great in this part, and so I read it in that actor's voice. Uh, or somebody similar to that, so that I can get that kind of, and I have to interact with the book like it. It slows down my reading tremendously, but I have to do it or else I just can't buy into it. I have to see it as a movie or a show going through my mind. Um, and so that's why whenever I go through here, I'm like, oh, what actor would play this? This guy, and it's easier with a graphic novel because they draw them. Yeah. And so you can say, oh, who looks like this guy? Um, but, all right, well, that'll be it for this episode of Comic uh, Rundown. Um, again, it's brought to you by Comic Den 316. You can find me on Instagram or Facebook uh, at Comic Den 316. Hopefully I can start getting these things on YouTube once I figure out how to join at least last century on the technology part. Uh, special thanks again to David Fleming for taking time out of your schedule uh, to sit and talk with me for an hour and a half. Uh, longer than that because you also filled me in on a bunch of stuff um, as well as talking to me before I even came up here helping me kind of get some things set up. Um, David, where's the best place for people to find you? Uh, Instagram is the best place to find me, Art of Mr. Fleming, as 1-M-F-L-E-M-I-N-G. Uh, Mr. David Fleming on Facebook, and I'd rather be drawing.com is my website. I, I mostly meant your address for people to literally... Uh, um, uh, uh, 3715, get out of my face. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, if you have any suggestions on trades to pick up or an episode idea, feel free to message me. Uh, if you would like to be a part of my show, hit me up. I'll try to find something for you. Uh, remember, if you enjoyed this episode, hit the thumbs up. If you like the channel, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that little bell. Bye, guys.